Rajkumar, Vice Chancellor of uh, Jindal Global University, Professor Arsh Sudarshan, Dean of the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy, and an old colleague, students, faculty, and other staff, distinguished guests. I'm honored to be here with you today as you commence a new academic year. Indeed, I am happy to be amongst the very first to welcome you back or to welcome you for the first time to Jindal Global University and the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy for the new academic year. Your university, as I've just heard from the Vice Chancellor himself, who's provided the vision, has in a very relatively short period of time become one of the better known universities in the country with what seems like a very bright future. I'm speaking today in my personal capacity and while the views I will express do not necessarily represent the official position of the United Nations and I have to give this disclaimer, uh, I believe many of the views do represent the views of many senior UN officials like myself and of the United Nations itself. Of all the many invitations I receive as the United Nations Resident Coordinator in Vietnam, invitations such as this one, where I have the privilege to address young people and discuss global po public policy issues with them, is amongst those that I look forward to most, since you represent hope and the future of this world. So thank you for inviting me. As you know, I am Indian. I have now been out of the country first for postgraduate studies and then to work globally for over 35 years since 1981, even though I have stayed in close touch with the country and come here often. But it is important for me to state and for you to know that the personal, student and professional experiences and influences that led me to this very rich journey across all continents to approximately 100 countries started in India and my career choices were largely shaped by my early life in India, not least when I was a student at Delhi University and then the Indian Institute of Management. It was also the life experiences I gained traveling to all four corners of India as a student that opened my eyes to issues of poverty and inequality and shaped my desire to become a development economist concerned with political economy issues, contributing to global public policy, influencing, shaping, and making, first through civil society, then through the global public policy think tank that I uh, created, which Sudarshan mentioned, and finally through the United Nations, where I first worked in New York as the head of globalization, and then based out of Malaysia, Turkey, and now Vietnam, as the head of the United Nations and UNDP uh, for almost two decades in the UN. Dear students, the United Nations is perhaps the world's greatest and hopefully most enduring and all-encompassing global public good. Those of you who are economists will understand the term global public good. It was built out of the ashes of the Second World War to ensure global peace and security and to prevent another world war. The world and its conflicts have changed considerably since the establishment of the United Nations in 1945. The organization has evolved to address these major challenges, albeit without adequate political will by many member states, without resources commensurate with its formidable long list of mandates and responsibilities, and without adequate innovative tools of engagement. We are facing all these obstacles and constraints today as never before at this particular global conjuncture when some believe multilateralism itself is under severe threat. I do not believe it is, and at least not in the medium to long term, and I will return to this issue towards the end of my talk. Today, the United Nations is an organization with almost four times as many members as it had at, at its founding in 1945. With 193 member states, we are the only universal intergovernmental organization with the legitimacy which comes from our unique membership and mandates. 
Despite the UN's obvious shortcomings and challenges, largely attributable, I would say, to its member states, it can look back at a proud record of achievements while seeking to readapt itself to the challenges of the 21st century, which rep represents a greatly changed global landscape from 1945 when the UN was established. The UN was born to protect and promote peace and security and to create a world without discrimination and inequality. Aside from ensuring peace and security and preventing a third world war, the UN's role has been to promote and protect human rights and protect and promote social and economic uh, development. All three mandates and pillars remain relevant and critical in the current global conjuncture of protracted civil wars and conflict, especially in the Middle East and Central and West Africa, but also in parts of South Asia and other parts of the world. It is important to also note that these three pillars are integrally linked. You cannot have peace and security without development or development without peace and security and neither will be possible without a fundamental respect for and the achievement of human rights. So many of the world's current seemingly intractable problems exist because of a lack of appreciation by both policymakers and ordinary citizens of the importance and interconnectedness of these three pillars which the United Nations represents, advocates and promotes in practice all around the world every single day. All of us should promote the three pillars of the UN, peace and security, development and furthering human rights, all of which each of you can help advocate with your families and friends and help promote both at an individual and societal level. The United Nations Charter which embodies these pillars as well as the fundamental values and principles on which the United Nations was founded over 70 years ago, therefore remains a timeless document and will stand you in good stead as a moral compass, especially in these difficult and challenging times for the world community. The very first article of the Charter states that the organization should, and I quote, take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace, end of quote. The basis for the peaceful settlement of disputes is found in Chapter 6 of the UN Charter, which requires states to first try to seek solutions through peaceful methods such as, and I quote again, negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to regional agencies or arrangements, or other peaceful means of their own choice, end of quote. These options remain critical today when extremist ideologies are destabilizing many parts of the world and threatening not just the values and principles of the United Nations, but multilateralism itself, as well as global peace and security. They also threaten to undermine or outright destroy decades of unprecedented, unprecedented social and economic development and human rights progress since the UN's founding. At such a time, the education and values uh, that universities provide, instill and inculcate in each of their students will be even more important than ever before. Moreover, embracing the UN's ideals of protecting human rights, eradicating poverty, reducing inequalities, combating climate change and resolving conflicts while advancing dignity, justice and equality for all people should be the centerpiece of the curriculum and teaching in schools such as yours. Indeed, schools of government and public policy have critical roles to play in influencing future global and national public policies through students such as you. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to now briefly but more closely examine each of the UN's three pillars, both historically since the UN's establishment and in the context of current reform initiatives at the United Nations. I will start with peace and security. The nature of conflict has been changing for centuries, and the 21st century is no exception. 73 years ago, at the time of the establishment of the United Nations, its founders were concerned with the prevention of wars between states. 
The UN's prime goal was world peace and security. And as I've already indicated, conflict prevention lies at the heart of the UN Charter. A crisis often begins with early warnings in the form of human rights violations and ends with post-conflict recovery, peace building and development efforts to avoid a relapse. If methods of alternative dispute resolution stated in Chapter 6 of the Charter fail, the responsibility of maintaining international peace and security lies with the UN Security Council. Established within the geopolitical reality of 1945, the Security Council has clearly not adapted to the changing geopolitical and economic realities of the 21st century. The permanent membership and the veto power have also often obstructed collective security and therein lies a considerable part of the problem of global governance today as I sadly saw at close quarters when I was in Turkey and I was partly responsible for the implementation of UN Security Council resolutions on Syria. There is clearly a dire need for a more democratically constituted and 21st century relevant Security Council. The only major reform of the Security Council occurred in 1965 when the non-permanent membership was increased from 6 to 10. There have been discussions at the UN itself on the need for UN Security Council and broader UN reform for more than 25 years, since 1990. At the 70th session of the General Assembly in 2015, a new momentum is in discussing reforms on membership and the veto began as the General Assembly adopted a landmark decision on advancing efforts to reform the Security Council. We are living in times where, where much more needs to be quickly done, however, and particularly by the five permanent members if the Security Council is to live up to its charter obligations. There is no room for complacency as we are facing unprecedented challenges. Those forcibly displaced reached a staggering 65 million people in 2017, which is the highest number since World War II. The now, they now spend longer than ever in displacement as protracted conflicts linger, and for the first time since the official fall of the end of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the total number of victims from brutal and violent con conflict have again started to increase. And I had the responsibility for th over three million Syrian refugees in Turkey alone when I was there. In today's new landscape, the UN must continue to adapt, reform, and become coherent as one. The UN Charter and its independent pillars and the principle of collective responsibility embodied in the Security Council remain important tools, but the challenges we face today demand an expanded, more innovative and contemporary toolbox in which conflict prevention should have a more prominent role. A major concern which over the last few decades and even more urgently in the last few years has emerged as a universal preoccupation is transnational violent extremism. Terrorism is not new but its geographical reach, financial resources, and the ability to attract mines is unsurpassed today. In addition, climate-related natural disasters are becoming more frequent and their destructive impacts more intense. Every year, we continue to achieve the wrong set of records, whether on air pollution, rising sea levels, or on greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. A related major concern in peace and security and global governance is the increase in the number and intensity of large-scale crises. Since 2008, the number of conflicts in the world has tripled. The Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Liberia, Afghanistan, Mali, South Sudan, Libya, Yemen, Iraq, and Syria, that list, which is not exhaustive, is long and unfortunately growing. There were around 70 UN peacekeeping operations and special political missions between 1948 and 2015, with approximately 15 currently ongoing, deploying more than 125,000 people, more than ever before. From 1st July 2017 to 30th June 2018 alone, an overall budget of US dollars 6.8 billion had to be approved to support these peacekeeping efforts, an amount that is increasing.
These conflicts are becoming more intractable and less conducive to political settlements due to factors such as transnational organized crime and violent extremism. The third related major concern we face in peace and security are the multiple crises of governance fueling disruption and violence. Today's violent conflicts are often rooted in poor governance, corruption, oppression, mismanagement of natural resources, exclusion and inequality. For example, systematic discrimination against minorities, which is widespread in the world, tends, tends to exacerbate the alienation on which terrorists feed, including in the Middle East and Central Africa, but even closer to home in South Asia, including India. So we need to ask ourselves, how can the UN's member states reform themselves better to help countries meet these challenges and build resilient societies through UN support that can deliver on the promise of leaving no one behind? How can we preserve the norms that will safeguard humanity and how can we win back the trust of the we the peoples that the UN Charter starts with in its first line and was meant to serve? The answer of Mr. Antonio Guterres, the current UN Secretary General, has been to prioritize crisis prevention in everything that the UN does. Crisis prevention should not just be understood as diplomatic action, but, and as I quote the Secretary General, a way to avert the outbreak of crises that take such a high toll on humanity, undermining institutions and capacities to achieve peace and development." End of quote. Therefore, noting that the UN's most serious shortcoming is our inability to prevent crises, the UN will need to work with its member states and other stakeholders to jointly increase their capacities to prevent crises by, first, a surge in preventive diplomacy, second, implementing sustainable peace resolutions, third, strengthening partnerships, and fourth, reforming the UN operational system to overcome fragmentation in order to consolidate our capacities to meet the prevention challenge. This is a transformation that is currently ongoing through a partial field-level merger of the UN's Department of Political Affairs and its Department of Peacekeeping Operations, which are part of a larger reform of the UN's peace and security architecture. Now let me turn to the second pillar, human rights. In today's world, for those that are more fortunate, human rights are like a melody that enriches the soul and at the same time enables them to expand and to exercise their choices and options freely. For those who are not so fortunate, human rights are a distant dream. They cherish and aspire to realize. For the UN, human rights are a core mandate as they promote freedom of speech, save child soldiers from warlords, empower women and minorities, protect children from abuse, eliminate impunity, and promote a development strategy that puts human beings at the center of it. Despite serious violations continuing and even growing in recent years, if one takes a longer term view going back to the UN's founding, and especially over the past two decades, as one must, the world has observed a progressively growing emphasis on human rights. At the national level, progress has been achieved through new laws and improved institutional frameworks based on the UN's human rights conventions in numerous countries. And the collective consciousness on human rights continues to gain momentum worldwide. But these positive developments have been and continue to be offset by a number of enduring challenges such as violence and crisis, the shrinking of space for freedom of speech and civil society, and growing social inequalities, especially impacting vulnerable people. As if these challenges were not enough, discrimination, disempowerment, and other forms of violence of human rights continue to pose formidable challenges to humanity, and we will need to better strengthen our collective efforts to achieve development with equity through a rights-based and people-centered approach with a special focus on conflict prevention, women, youth, and marginalized segments of society. At a broader societal level, strengthening the rule of law and human rights protects fragile states and translates aspirations for peace and justice into reality, as they are, together with peace, security, and development, 
the foundations of a fair and stable society. Continued active support for human rights and the rule of law as important means to achieving sustainable peace and development is therefore not just necessary but essential, as is the strengthening of national and cross-national judicial systems. As former UNDP Administrator Ms. Helen Clark, previous Prime Minister of New Zealand, once said, and I quote, by working to strengthen the rule of law in some of the most difficult environments in the world, we are striving to help countries to recover from conflict and violence and to establish peace which is underpinned and reinforced by sustainable development. We recognize the rule of law to be uniquely central to all three pillars of the UN's mandate, human rights, peace and security, and development." End of quote. The important interrelationship between these three pillars in the context of challenging issues such as inequality, human rights abuse, fragility, political accountability and conflict lie at the heart of the concept of the responsibility to protect, endorsed by world leaders at the 2000 UN World Summit. The R2P, as it is known for short, was a milestone achievement. This concept reframes sovereignty from negative involvement to positive responsibility, through which governments have a duty to protect their populations from the most serious crimes. R2P requires prevention, but when governments fail in that primary obligation, the international community needs to step in to address the plight of that country's citizens, because failure to rise to that obligation will lead to more human suffering, also reverberating across borders. There is no better example of this than the current crisis in Syria. I saw the consequences in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and even Europe, uh, especially Greece, of the Syrian crisis over almost four intense years as the UN resident coordinator in Turkey between 2013 and 2016. Another example is the UN Security Council's Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. This landmark resolution that seeks to bring a voice to half the world's population and ensure that they are active participants at the table for the prevention and resolution of conflicts has not received proper attention by mem many member UN states. A global study launched in 2015, the 15th anniversary of the resolution, and its subsequent visibility and recommendations will hopefully provide new momentum for empowering women in peacekeeping and peace building. Another tool with prevention at its core is the Human Rights Upfront Initiative, launched by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2013, which demonstrates the UN's continued commitment to human rights in the context of rule of law, justice, and security. This initiative, inspired by lessons learned in particular, but not only from the devastating civil war in our neighboring country, Sri Lanka, over a number of decades, is a response to the systematic failure of the UN and the broader international community to meet their responsibilities in the face of atrocities. Mainly a UN initiative, it seeks changes in three different dimensions. First, cultural change among UN staff to act with moral courage. Second, operational change to better detect human rights violations. And third, political change, which requires the UN to engage with member states both in their national context and globally through the Security Council in a more transparent, open, and proactive manner on human rights. The UN will need to continue to provide active support to governments, the private sector, NGOs, youth, academia, and media to combine forces to promote and protect human rights for all. And we should not forget that together with civil and political rights and human, all human beings, no matter where they live, have, invisible, have indivisible economic, social, and cultural rights. These are recognized and protected through international human rights instruments, which include but are not limited to the freedom of expression, right to assembly, right to life, and to a standard of living supportive of a life and dignity. Human rights are universal, indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. And UN declarations and conventions have taken the key notions of universality a step further by committing UN member states to the promotion and protection of all human rights for all people 
regardless of their political, economic and cultural systems. But even though the world still has a long way to go in terms of implementation, never in human history has respect for human rights as an international norm been so widely accepted or been so visibly visible globally, regionally and even at the national level as through and because of the work of the United Nations worldwide. Today, people from different linguistic communities have translated the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into 444 dialects and languages, truly making it a universal document. And now to the third very important pillar, development or sustainable development, as we now refer to it. Sustainable development is at the heart of the United Nations, but for far too many, it also seems distant. Inequalities are on the rise, leaving people behind, including in developed countries where millions of jobs have disappeared or are out of reach due to limited availability of quality education for some, and particularly for youth, where unemployment rates are higher than they have been in decades. Globalization is under attack by far too many who are discontent or have lost their trust in the multilateral system. Let us have a closer look at how we arrived at this point. The development debate began with the early history of welfare economics and went through a number of evolutions. And even though it continues to evolve, in many ways it culminated in paradigmatic terms with human development thinking promoted by the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, when it launched its first global human development report in 1990, which interestingly was the intellectual brainchild and result of close cooperation between two prominent South Asian economists, an Indian and a Pakistani. Nobel Economics Laureate and Philosopher, Dr. Amartya Sen, and Dr. Mehboobul Haq of Pakistan. This remains the most comprehensive and multi-dimensional development paradigm at the global level even today, despite the fact that its measurement continues to lag behind the conceptual thinking in this area, largely because of both data and political will related challenges in UN member states, nationally, regionally, and globally, and because of inadequate global governance, especially of transnational private companies, but also because of growing transnational crime and violent extremism. But to go back to an earlier period, utilitarianism and later theories based on it dominated Western economic thought after the Second World War, focusing mainly on aggregate welfare and monetary measures of welfare. In this context, GDP or gross domestic product and economic growth emerged as leading indicators of national progress and hence welfare in many countries, even though GDP was acknowledged to have severe limitations as a measure of well-being. The main reasons for this were and continue to be the following. National income accounts, which measure GDP, only register monetary exchanges. No other measure of development and capabilities measuring the welfare of a country are captured by GDP. Economic measures equate goods with commodities and services that are not always goods, but sometimes bads, such as nuclear weapons, the production of which might contribute to economic growth and even increase per capita income, although they tend to lower social welfare. This confirms that economic growth does not always lead to enhanced welfare or well-being. Such an approach counts both bads and their cures, or anti-bads, such as the cost of cleaning petroleum spills. Such an approach treats natural resources as free and limitless. Such an approach places no value on women's unpaid work in the family, in informal agriculture, or other unpaid informal occupations. Such an approach places no value on leisure time. Such an approach ignores freedoms and human rights. Such an approach ignores the distribution of income within society. In the 1970s and 80s, the development debate included a discussion of alternative approaches going beyond GDP, including putting greater emphasis on employment, followed by redistribution with growth, and then the basic needs approach. These debates and ideas helped pave the way for the human development paradigm. Simultaneously, the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s shifted the focus to conflicts within states, and this confluence and conjuncture helped and contributed 
to the formal launch of the human development paradigm by UNDP in 1990. Eminent modern theorists, including Nobel economics laureate and Indian economist and philosopher, Dr. Amartya Sen, introduced a new concept of social welfare, which was unbound by the rules of neoclassical economics. He convincingly pointed to the lack of pluralism in utilitarianism, arguing that the latter theory insists on the importance of having a single measure of well-being as opposed to different and non-commensurate elements. As an alternative, Sen put forward and defended a pluralistic understanding of well-being, emphasizing that one can be well off without actually being well. There is now an increasing understanding and agreement on the limitations of monetary measurements of well-being and public policies built solely on such measures on markets and on economics. Since 1990, with the introduction of the concept and measurement of human development in UNDP's first Global Human Development Report that year, we have witnessed a general shift towards a broader definition of development, integrating multidimensional elements of well-being based on rights such as access to opportunities, a healthy life, education and dignity. The Human Development Report has since become an annual milestone reporting global progress and witnessing transformations in developing countries uh, and major economies. It, is it has had growing political influence that has substantively impacted national and global human development progress, not least in India, where many, even most states now produce their own reports and indices and compete with each other on their annual scores and comparative rankings. Although there are critics of the human development approach who argue that it is not an alternative to growth and income dominated understanding of development, even calling it old wine and a new bottle, nevertheless it is widely acknowledged that the human development approach has been one of the most important contributions both to enlarging the concept and our understanding of what development is as well as to diluting the dominance of national income as a measure of development and well-being. In this context, while by 2020, the three leading developing countries, Brazil, China and India, will have surpassed the aggregate production of Canada, France, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom and the United States, please keep in mind that economic growth does not automatically translate into human development progress, as is clearly evident in India, which as a whole, despite states such as Kerala, which rank high, still ranks low on UNDP's Human Development Index. There is a strong need for new policies and investments in capacity building in the sectors of education, nutrition, health and employment skills in India. In general, we will also need to more strongly focus our efforts on enhancing equity, including on the gender dimension, enabling greater voice and participation of citizens, including youth, confronting environmental pressures, and managing demographic change. September 2000 marked a historical moment in cooperation between the UN and member states when they signed the Millennium Declaration, certifying their commitment to a new global partnership for poverty eradication, development and environmental protection. This was an embodiment of some of the basic material aspects of human development, most relevant to the least developed and low income countries. But it was neither a rights-based agenda nor universal or very ambitious. Nevertheless, since then, many but not all countries have consistently and steadfastly upheld these commitments, making tremendous strides towards the achievement of eight Millennium Development Goals by their target year 2015. In addition, increased global UN peacekeeping efforts have helped to both prevent the escalation of conflicts and disputes and support UN resolutions by peaceful means based on respect by all for the UN Charter and its accompanying international treaties and conventions. In September 2015, heads of states and governments at the UN Summit in New York adopted the much more ambitious and universally applicable 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, comprising 17 Sustainable Development Goals, so-called SDGs, outlining a global and national to-do list till 2030. The key message and purpose of the 2030 Agenda 
which is a much more holistic and comprehensive embodiment and articulation of the original human development paradigm and concept, and equally importantly is rights-based, is to leave no one behind. Agenda 2030 will remain at the core of countries' current and future development reforms till at least 2030. These efforts will continue to actively engage the UN in countries in partnership with their governments, development partners, civil society organizations, the private sector, and other key implementing partners. The SDGs will remain the key driver of the United Nations and an essential means for long-term prevention of conflict and better well-being for all. Agenda 2030 recognizes that the best way to prevent societies from descending into crisis is to ensure that they are resilient, inclusive, sustainable, engaged in the promotion and protection of human rights, and that they have the capacities to manage risks and shocks effectively by undertaking concerted action. Agenda 2030 also recognizes that current investments in all countries, economically developed and developing, to help them build strong and inclusive institutions and resilient communities are clearly insufficient. While this is particularly true for the least developed countries and low-income low countries and those in special and fragile circumstances, it is indeed also true for the United States and most other economically advanced countries. So far, over 140 UN country teams have received government requests for support for their national efforts towards successful SDG implementation, including from India. A bold agenda also needs bold reforms at and off the United Nations, if it is to deliver on Agenda 2030. The UN Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, recognizes this and has publicly committed to making the UN fit for purpose for achieving Agenda 2030 through a renewed emphasis on the prevention of conflicts, addressing development challenges, and by transforming the current UN development system in order to improve accountability and to better support countries in the implementation of Agenda 2030 and the Paris Climate Agreement, which is an integral part of the SDGs and an important potential contributor to its achievement. As a result of the current Secretary General's bold UN development system reform proposals, on 31st May 2018, the UN General Assembly adopted a landmark consensus resolution on repositioning the UN development system, hailed by Mr. Guterres as the new era of multilateral support for country priorities. It is the most ambitious and comprehensive planned transformation of the UN development system in decades. It hopes to ensure that UN support can adapt better to recent global developments and optimally assist and support governments in tackling existing bottlenecks to successfully achieve their nationally adapted SDGs. The 2030 Agenda, which promotes action to end global poverty, protects the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity, is the most ambitious global development agenda ever agreed by consensus in world history. And you should view yourselves as young UN ambassadors who one day will be sent out into the world to spread this message. Don't miss the opportunity and please seize it with both hands. Dear students, you are very lucky to be students who have come of age in a global era where young people like yourselves have more opportunities and means to publicly voice your opinions and be heard compared with any other generation before yours. You are learning how to be global explorers and are used to making friendships across the boundaries of language, culture and nationality. In addition, you study government and public policy, both areas that are of the highest importance, not only at national, but at global level. Good global governance in an era of accelerating globalization is critical, and global public policy, which is manifest in legal international treaties, conventions, and other formal arrangements between governments, with the aim of seeking an international or global balance between powers, as well as preventing conflicts, will become even more important for you and, your, and future generations. What we today perceive as global governance can be said to have begun in the early 1800s. A system of international law began to develop gradually thereafter along with nascent international institutions. 
It should be noted here that the development of international law is often subject to more controversy, dispute, and competing interpretations than most domestic jurisprudence, while global institutions have rarely kept pace with the world's changing power structure, not to mention technological and economic realities. I am convinced, and I hope you are too, that just like globalization cannot be reversed, nor can multilateralism. The two are sometimes strange, but essential bedfellows, since one requires the other to survive and make progress. Since multilateralism is here to stay for the long haul, if the UN didn't exist, the world would have to reinvent it, and many of the UN uh, member states would have to find ways to deal with their own shortcomings, which then get translated into the United Nations. Allow me, as I get close to the end of this speech, both to dwell a moment on the UN's successes and on some of the challenges it faces going forward. Any objective observer will agree that the United Nations has made many contributions to the world, from overseeing decolonization, to preventing a third world war, to leading and supporting efforts that have allowed the world to arrive at a point in time in 2015 and now, when for the first time, poverty eradication is now in sight and achievable by 2030 if there is the political will to do so. Indeed, yours will be the first generation in world history to experience a world largely free from hunger and poverty. I genuinely believe, therefore, as I've just said, that if, that if the UN did not exist today, the global community of nations would urgently need to reinvent it. Um, nevertheless, now is also an opportunity to spotlight where the UN and the international community as a whole have failed. We need to redouble our collective efforts to meet current and future challenges. As the Secretary General said in his UN Day message last year, our world faces many grave challenges, widening conflicts and inequality, security threats, including nuclear weapons. We have the tools and wealth to overcome these challenges. All we need is the will. Looking to the future, many important challenges remain and new ones are emerging all the time. The increased frequency of devastating weather-related events highlights the world's growing vulnerability to both climate change and disaster risk. And special emphasis will need to be placed on poor and vulnerable populations. Furthermore, governments will need to place stronger emphasis on a whole-of-society partnership approach, more actively embracing partners such as the private sector and civil society as well as universalizing access to basic social and health services and ensuring education for all. What about the role of India and Indians in all of this? Both will have an increasingly larger global footprint and growing responsibility to the international community in the years ahead. It is urgent, therefore, that despite some successes since its independence, India first puts its domestic house in order, which currently is beset by many challenges some old and others new. It, is also, it also needs to put renewed and responsible energy into providing regional leadership in South Asia and the Trumpian Indo-Pacific region announced in Da Nang, Vietnam by the US at the APEC summit in November 2017 before it can credibly occupy the permanent UN Security Council seat for which it has aspired with legitimate cause for so long. To credibly do so, India will among other things, need to build on and strengthen its greatest assets since its foundation, its secular, deep-rooted democracy, reinforcing its checks and balances and making them more robust. It will also need to increase respect for its multiple diversities and minorities, not weaken these. Unfortunately, these are challenging times for India and for Indian democracy and diversity, as it is widely perceived that some of India's greatest and time-honored assets are under threat from certain quarters at the current time. Dear government and public policy students, your first responsibility as Indian citizens and students of government and public policy is to protect and strengthen India's unique assets. Indeed, it will be your responsibility sooner than you might think to find peaceful solutions to India's the regions and the world's problems while respecting fundamental freedoms and the principle of equality for all. The challenge of battling extreme ideologies, 
climate change, celebrating and advancing multiculturalism, and protecting and ensuring the universal application of human rights are but some of the critical challenges that your generation inherits from mine, both in India, regionally, and globally. I would like to encourage you to embrace and, and address these challenges in the spirit of the United Nations Charter, just as you embrace this exciting phase of your lives. As you prepare to go out into the world to make your contribution to it, please keep in mind the timeless and wise words of our preeminent independence leader and father of the Indian nation, Mahatma Gandhi. And I quote, be the change you wish to see. I trust and hope that the change you all wish to see in your lifetimes and for your children and future generations is consistent with the highest ideals of Mahatma Gandhi, the timeless UN Charter, and the Indian Constitution, another amazing, inspiring, and far-sighted document. My best wishes to all of you for your new academic school year and for your futures to each one of you. And don't forget to enjoy every moment of it. Thank you. Thank you.